Praise the Lord. Good to see everybody this, this morning. I appreciate the spirit of praise. And thank God it's not just something where we can come together and sing and feel good. There's a reason behind it. Praise the Lord. Well, you know, last week we focused on Colossians 2 and 3. And the title of the message was, I, I think it wound up being all and in all. And it focused on Christ and the fact that what we have is not religion but a person. The answer to everything is not not policies and procedures and and uh, all those kinds of things, but it's a person. And, uh, you know, my mind went back to one of the scriptures, though. There's a, there's a point that I feel like is critical. I certainly came up in my own life this week when I came face to face with a need, and then immediately there was a thought that came to me. And it, it was connected with this passage, and it's in Colossians chapter 2, one of the scriptures we focused on, but there's one aspect of it, like I say, that we did not. In verse 6, so then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So the one, po uh, one point that I have often made out of this verse is that the principle by which we're saved in the first place is the principle by which we live. There's not two different things. There's this constant sense where I need something I don't have and the answer is in Christ. Everything that I need is in him. But there is a, you know, language is a funny thing. There are no two languages where there is a word that has the exact equivalent in another language. There is a range of meaning within this culture of a certain word that's used. If it, you take it over here and you have to translate it sort of one way or another, and it doesn't quite capture the whole meaning. And one of the, verse, one of the words that uh, jumped out at me, as I said this week, was the word received. And... In English, the word received almost has a passive con connotation. It's like I'm sitting there and I get a package and I receive it and I sign for it and all of that, but it's, there's not a lot of action on my part. It, I'm, I'm sort of passive to it. And there's a lot of the gospel that's preached today that's a little bit like that. It's so simplistic that I just accept it. I just receive it. And that's about all there is to it almost. But there is an action part of this that is that we can easily overlook and we can, we can get stuck in the mode where we're asserting all that Christ is but not benefiting as we should and we're stuck in our individual lives in certain areas. And I won't ask for a show of hands how many people who are, you know, in that place where you're sort of stuck. I mean, you know that there's things that, that Christ has provided but somehow we're not, you know, you're not enjoying that. And I certainly would have to raise my hands because it is a journey and we do face uh, things all along and issues all along where we need that change that we were singing about this morning. The Lord's changing us, isn't he? Thank God he is. Thank God he will continue that work until that day. And the, the end of it is a certainty for everyone that has genuinely given their heart to him. But there is, most of the time, if you were to trace that Greek word through the New Testament, it does not say receive, it says take. Now, that's quite a difference, isn't it? If I just receive something, that's one thing. But if I, you know, I'm, I'm just really, you know, I'm, I'm asserting my part. There's a part that I play where I am reaching out and I am taking that. And that's what I felt like in my own experience that was lacking. That there was an area where I wasn't taking. Christ was offering. It was available. It was there. But I wasn't really aggressively taking and that is an aspect of truth that I, we need that, that balance. Thank God for everything God has done. He has provided everything, and not only did he provide it, but he came seeking us. He came convicting us so that we would have an, a heart-level belief, a conviction that we need him and that he's the answer. Because that's the only foundation for, for approaching him and coming to him. There's nothing in us that would ever do that. So it's God, but there's a point at which he looks for a response. You know, I think I've mentioned before, and I don't remember if it was last week or not, but there are some that so emphasize the sovereignty of God that it's almost like we have very little responsibility. And others that em so emphasize the response of man that it's like God is a beggar trying to sign us up for some better plan than for our life. But there is an awesome provision of God that is sovereign. He is in charge. The question is not whether he's sovereign. The question is how does he use that sovereignty? And he uses that to appeal to, to men, to convict them, but to bring us to a point of real surrender 
But it's, not, it's more than just an acquiescence where we just say, okay, I give in. There, I'll tell you, we've got things to overcome. And I follow a number of scriptures, and I just want to kind of go through some of these and, and balance this truth out or at least enlarge upon it, show what that meaning of that word really is. Receive, again, is more than just, you know, a, a passive thing. How about Matthew chapter 11? Matthew chapter 11 is uh, a passage where Jesus was asked about John the Baptist, who had, was the forerunner who came announcing that he was coming. And Jesus said this was very interesting in verse 12 of chapter 11 of Matthew. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. Well, now, one thing that we mentioned last week is certainly contained in that, and that's the fact that God's, what God is doing in the world is a divine invasion. That could easily have been the title. But there is an invasion that God is doing that is forceful and it's mighty, and it's invading the devil's territory to rescue people for, e for eternity. But that's not the whole of it, is it? Because it says forceful men lay hold of it. There is an effort, there is a, there's an opposition any time you and I would try to move toward the kingdom of God. I know you know that if you know the Lord at all. You know that this doesn't come without opposition. And the question is, what do we do about that? Do we just sort of say, oh, it's not for me, or a thousand and one uh, responses that would cause us to stop short of what God has provided fully when he wants us to put forth some genuine effort and yet, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but thank God it's not a self-effort, but there's an effort. There is an absolute reaching forth that, that has to be, where our, our will has to be geared up, and there's an insistence about it. You know, one uh, picture that came back to my mind is one I've mentioned before, and that's from Pilgrim's Progress. When you remember early in, in uh, the journey where, Pilgrim, where, where Christian was headed for the celestial city, he came to the house of the interpreter. And the purpose of that was to learn some spiritual truth, and this was prior to his actually encountering the cross and, feeling, and, and losing his burden, but he learned some things. One of the things that he learned, the interpreter showed him a beautiful castle. And everyone in that castle was, was happy and healthy and, and rejoicing, and it just looked like a wonderful place to be. And outside of that castle were a number of very strong soldiers who were, who were standing there with swords to oppose anybody who would try to get in that castle. And there was a company of men who acted like, I'd sure like to be in there. But they looked at, these, they looked at this opposition and they just, they, they were afraid. They backed off. They wouldn't go. And then he saw one, one man go up to a, a table where someone, someone was writing down the names of those who were going in and gave him his name, put on his armor, and he just took off one man against all of these, and he just valiantly fought his way through and then was received into the castle. Folks, that's a better picture of salvation than a lot that's preached. I'll tell you, if anybody gets saved, it's going to be against a whole lot of stuff that's going on in here. You've got enemies in here that will not yield, that don't want to don't want to surrender, that you want to bargain with God, there's a thousand and one things that will stop you from really entering the kingdom of God. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to be able to push, that, push through that. There's going to have to be a willingness, not just to passively say, okay, Lord, put the salvation in my back pocket, a ticket to heaven, and I'll go on with my life. This is something, this is an all or nothing kind of thing. And I'll tell you, you won't get to that place until you realize the stakes that this is an all-or-nothing question. We are either going to be destroyed or we're going to live forever with him, and the, the, only, the price of salvation is our life. And you're going, to have the, you're going to have the devil whispering in your ear a thousand and one things that will cause you to say, wait a minute, what about this, what about that? And we're going to have to be willing to push through. And so just even coming to Christ, this is not some simple little okay, God, I'll go along with you kind of thing. God is looking for people who are dead serious. You remember, how the, remember the parable of the, uh, of the sower? 
you had some that had no, that the seed had no effect on their hearts and their minds. They just were so seared, so hardened. But there were, there were two other categories of people whose li- upon whose lives and upon whose hearts the seed of the Word of God fell. One of them, the soil was shallow. Boy, does that picture a lot of the American church. I mean, you know, the idea of forgiveness of sins, being a friend of God, getting to go to heaven one day, pray, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll go along. I'll be willing to go, go to church and, and take up that lifestyle and all that. Yeah, who, who doesn't want a deal like that? And, uh, but what happens? The problem is underneath it's rocky. There are issues in the heart that have never been touched, never been confronted. Self is still on the throne. The principle of sin still rules, and it doesn't take but the right circumstances for them to say, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. You know, I've said many times, when persecution comes to this country, how many people, how many, how many people will still identify as with Christ? It's going to change a lot, isn't it? That's what's happening in India right now. They're, they're undergoing a very particular persecution, and it's, it's growing. But we, we can stand with our brothers there. But you know it's having good fruit? God always advances his kingdom in the face of whatever the devil throws. We're asleep here. We don't know what's going on. We, we, you know, if you, if you have any awareness at all, you can see the forces of, the, of darkness gathering. And all it takes is the right circumstances, and the things are going to change dramatically. And, but God's getting his people ready. I'm not, we don't, he doesn't call on us to, upon us to fear. But anyway, there is a, there is a battle to fight to get in the kingdom. When, and I mentioned the, uh, the parable of the sower. The other one was somebody who, uh, yeah, they accepted the word. That was great. And they started to produce something. And then, but then the cares of this world took over. They were more interested in this world. That was the real priority. The true priority of their life was what they could you know, what they could get out of this world, what uh, their life in it, all the issues connected with it. The kingdom of God was not the center. Folks, for God's people, God's kingdom is the bottom line. And you're going to have a, you're going to have a fight on your hands if you enter this kingdom. But I'll tell you, the glorious thing is when we fight, when we agree and say, yes, Lord, I want this with all of my heart, you're going to find out that God will come along and help you. You're going to find out it's not, not up to your strength at all. All of a sudden, God comes on the scene. That's what grace is about. It's by grace that we're saved. God has to help us. But when our wills align with his truth and with his provision and his purpose, he, and we set our hearts to do what he says, he will come on the scene, and we're going to find out we're not alone. That's real salvation. That's the principle by which people come in. Now, I thought about another scripture that, that is closely connected with this, and I think it's in uh, Luke 13, if I remember correctly. Yeah, this is, this is one we used to hear a lot and need, to, and need to not forget that it's in the book. Jesus was going from village to village, verse 22, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Well, he didn't directly answer it, but indirectly he did. He said, he said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Now, how do you put that together with just accepting Jesus or receiving him. I mean, I realize there's a, sometimes that can, deci- that can describe something that is genuine. Thank God for every time it does. But oh, there's so much, there's such, so much deeper truth in that. Because here are people who actually are making some kind of an effort. They see the kingdom of God to some degree, and they're trying to enter it, and they want to enter it, but they're not able to. Why in the world? Is God trying to keep them out? Did anybody here think that God's just trying to block the door and say, no, you can't come in. I don't care how hard you try. You're not. No, that's not it. What's the issue? The issue is there's something they're not willing to let go. At some point, there, has, there is a choice that has to be made regarding the kingdom of God and something in their life. I mean, you, I'm sure everybody by now has thought about the rich young ruler. 
Classic example. Here was a young, here was a young man who was zealous for serving God with everything he knew, which was the Jews' religion and the law of Moses, and he'd kept it from the time he was a boy. He was scrupulous about it. He was, he was zealous toward God and all of that. And so he comes and said, I've done all the things that you, as you talked about. Oh, what, what, you know, what else do I lack? And Jesus said, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come and take up your cross and follow me. Now, that's not a general command to everybody, but that was the God of his, of his life, wasn't it? That was the issue. There was a narrow door there, and he couldn't bring his love of his wealth. I mean, God's not against people having money if, if, it's, if he has them and has their hearts. God has all kinds of people, thank God. But for this man, this was his God. And when that one was put that way, you are either going to be in the kingdom of God or you're going to have your wealth. He went away sadly, didn't he? So this is a pretty good description of somebody who wanted to enter but wasn't able. Folks, we're going to have to come. God's going to put his finger on issues in every single life. And I say that to ones growing up here. God is going to put his finger on the issues of your life. It may be some ambition. It may be some desire for for a mate. It could be a thousand and one things that, you, that your life and your affections get fixed on. But I'll tell you, if we come to Christ, th those things are going to be laid on the altar. He is going to be Lord. Isn't that what that scripture in uh, Colossians 2 says? It isn't just that we accept him or we, what, what was the word again? Uh, yeah, we receive him Boy, I'm tired this morning. My brain just doesn't, doesn't function. Thank God. He still functions, though. But it, it talks about our having received him how? As Lord. In other words, he's in charge. That's what the kingdom of God is about. God is the only one through his Son who is able to change us and knows what needs to be changed for us to be fit to live with him for eternity. We're not going to bring self along. He's going to deal with that. Of course, what he replaces self with is so much better. Thank God. Thank God. But do you see this balance that you see in the Scriptures between the fact that we come to a place of surrender, which sounds very passive on the one hand, but there's also this battle, this fight to get to lay hold of that. I'm going to have to put forth everything that I've got into this battle. I want that more than I want my next breath. That's what it really comes down to, to enter into the kingdom of God. But I find in my own life, and I don't think I'm alone in this, that there are so many times when I'll come up against a need. And I know theologically and scripturally what the answer is. I mean, I wouldn't dare say, God, you didn't prepare me for this. You didn't, you didn't provide for this. There's no, really, there's no real answer for this. I'm just stuck being who I am. This is who I am. That's all there is to it. I'm stuck. I mean, how many think that's the case? We all know it isn't. Either, Christ, either God has provided everything we need in Christ or he hasn't. So if he has provided everything and we're not walking in that, where is the issue? Is it with God? It's with me, isn't it? God is looking for people who are, who are going to be on board with him completely and, and looking to him and trusting in him and, and know, not only knowing that I have a need but being bold enough. You see, there, there's got to be an assertiveness on my part. And that was, that was the kind of the reaction I had to something. I said, wait a minute. You know, I'm sitting here being a victim. I'm sitting here putting up with something when God has already told me what the answer is. I need to get up on my hind leg and say, wait a minute. I insist upon obtaining what Christ has provided for me. It belongs to me. God is looking for a greater boldness and assertiveness in his people to lay hold of what he has already paid such a high price to give us. That's the heart of the burden that I felt this morning. And I, I, I see God saying, oh, I've done everything for you, and here you sit. 
and you're stuck, and there's needs in your life. But what, what are you doing? I'm wait, you're waiting on me. I'm waiting on you. I've given you everything. Do you care? You know, that's the question about salvation itself. Do you care enough to say, I want that more than I want anything? I'm willing to fight. I'm willing to go through any obstacle. Lord, I've got to have that. But you know, we need that exact same dynamic going on in our hearts with respect to every need in our lives. I must have that. I've got to have it. Boy, this is another one of these. I hope I'm listening. Because, I mean, the Lord puts me, allows me to go through things that I know everybody else here experiences. We are, on a, we are sharing in a journey. I'm not up here because I'm, I'm way up here and I've attained all these things. Any more than Paul said he wasn't. He said, I haven't attained all this. Nobody in this world has attained all of this, but we, we need a, a greater clarity, a vision about what, how God does business in the world, what his salvation consists of, and our part in it. Because there are things that you and I could enjoy starting today. We could move in that direction, and we could, we could overcome things in our lives and, and, and grow in him. There's so, there are so many virtues, so many things that he tells us for example, we went over a little bit in, in Colossians chapter 3. The consequence of Christ being our life and our being dead in him and all of that is, okay, now put to death all these things up in the earth. Stop lying to each other. Stop doing all these other bad things. And start, uh, you know, take unto yourself the virtues of love and peace and, and joy and fellowship with one another. All these things are there. Upon what foundation? Upon my, the foundation of my you know, I have willpower and strength? Not at all. You know, it's interesting that when the, uh, you know, when the rich young ruler, that's Luke 18 is one of the accounts of that if you want to look it up. But when the rich young ruler went away sadly, Jesus made the comment about how hard it is for rich people. Well, why is that? Because they're rich and they value that above the kingdom of God. But that could, that could apply to anything in anybody's life that you value more than you value eternity. But when he said that, the disciples said, who can be saved? <laughs> That's a good question. Who can be saved? But Jesus' answer is revealing not just about the rich people. He said, with, God, with men, this is impossible. Do you realize salvation is impossible for every single person right here? If by possible you mean I can do it, I can, some, I can accomplish something, I can win God's favor by something that I do. There's some resource in me that I can draw upon and God will accept me because of that. It's impossible. Every one of us has to come to the point where we recognize that salvation is only possible because God acts. See, that's the ground we stand upon when we come to him. God, the thing that I see in my life is impossible. I've struggled my whole life to beat this thing, and I can't do it. But God, you, you're the one who's told me it's impossible for me, but it's possible with you. Help me to change my vision and my attitude about, about salvation and stop looking to me and stop making excuses and stop all the stuff that I do to sidestep what you want to do in my life. God, help me to come to that place where I have that boldness. I'll tell you, we've got a God who values boldness. He values that, that kind of a heart that says, I will not accept anything less. In some ways I'm galloping through this, but that's all right. I'll tell you, God, the, the, thought, the central thought is, is such a simple one. But I just pray that God will, will get it through our thick skulls, what he's wanting from us today. He doesn't want us to go and say, oh, that was wonderful truth. Praise God and then go back to our lives like they are and not be changed by it. God wants to change me. He wants to change you, but you and I have a part to play. Are we going to seek him? Are we going to believe him? Are we going to actually stand on the promises? Or as my dad used to say, just sit on the premises. And that's what a lot of Christians do. Instead of standing on the promises, they're sitting on the premises, sleeping, when the Lord has done so much, he's given everything for us. Praise God. 
We rightly worship Him. He alone is worthy of our worship. But, you know, one of, the, one of the scriptures that came back to me, and I, I guess we can turn to it so you'll know where it's at, is in Genesis 32, I believe. Remember, Jacob was one of the patriarchs, and he was a character. He did a lot of things his own way, and the Lord worked in spite of it. How many are glad the Lord works in spite of us? Yeah. He reaches us when we're in a condition of great need, and he begins to mold our hearts and our minds, and he brings us out of all, all kinds of things. Jacob was somebody who believed in the covenant. I mean, he valued the covenant, and he valued the, uh, the birthright that would have caused him to be able to step into the benefits of that covenant with God, the covenant relationship. His older brother Esau didn't care. Because one day he got really hungry and he traded his birthright for a bowl of, of soup or a bowl of beans or whatever it was. And so he despised that birthright. So in spite of the fact that, he, that Jacob cheated him out of it, what you see in him is a, is a heart that says, I want that. that. That matters to me. And God began to mold that and, and meet with him. And he had to flee from his brother and go to another country and wound up getting married and, and acquiring flocks and herds, and he starts back. In the process, God reveals himself to him in greater and greater ways and says, I'll, I'll go, you know, don't be afraid, I'm with you. And now, he, now he's coming back to meet Esau, though. And he remembers how it was when they parted. Esau was trying to kill me. And then he hears Esau is coming with 400 men. Whoa! <laughs> And he reacts just like you and I would. So he does everything he can think of to do. He separates his family into two groups, and he sends gifts ahead, and he just does everything he can naturally think of to do to try to mollify his brother's anger at him. And then he's left alone, isn't he? And it says in verse, 30, verse 24, is it, So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. And this is the reply. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Think of the boldness. Think of the, the brassy, I will not let you go. You, I, I've got to have, I was driven by need. But here is a man who was crying. He's, he's, he's talking to God. He's, I, I don't know if this is Christ or an angel, but whatever it was, he was not dealing with just a man. He was dealing with something more than that. And yet he has the gall, if you want to put it that way, to say, I will not let you go. How many of you think that God wants us to have that kind of a boldness with him? I'll tell you, God, didn't, God wasn't offended by this. This is really what God was looking for, was that sense of, I have got to have you. If I don't have you, I am a goner. I want you above all else, God. I need you. And there's this holy boldness to say, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And God blessed him. Isn't there a lesson in that? That there's a boldness that you and I have, need to have with God. Oh, how timidly we approach Him. Oh, pretty please, God. Pretty please help me in this. And then if, it doesn't, if we don't have feelings within a certain period of time, oh, well, I guess I'm not one of the ones, or I guess it's not for me, I'm just poor old me, or a thousand and one different ways we get turned aside. I'll tell you, the obstacle is not God. God's going to allow all kinds of things to come our way. In this case, it was fear, but whatever it is, God is looking for people who are going to have that kind of a spirit, and He doesn't despise that. That's what He's looking for from you and from me today. It's a heart that not only says, thank God for this grand, wonderful, perfect provision for salvation, 
Thank God for it. But I will not rest until I possess that. Don't look at me that way. Am I telling you the truth? Is this truth or are we just sort of not so sure about that? What does God think about me? Who, who am I to talk to God like that? But I'll tell you, God's not the problem. God is looking for people who are bold enough to say, that is mine. I don't come because I deserve this. See, that issue's gone. I'm not just trying to command God to come and serve me. This is not about me and, and what I want in the world. I'm just going to command God to come and, ser- and be my servant. This is me wanting to be his, wanting to enter into what he has provided and, and being unwilling to say no and, and unwilling to be turned aside. I'll tell you, God loves that kind of a person. You will seek me, he said, and find me when you search for me with all your heart. There's plenty of times when God will allow circumstances. He will allow time. He will allow uh, the devil to talk to us. He will allow every, all of our nature will rise up and say, no, you can't have this. I'm, I will not let go. That's the time when we need to learn how to take a stand in our spirits and say, I will not let go. I will not back down from what I am asking because there it is in the Word of God. God has said, it's mine. It's my inheritance. I will not simply walk away from it and say, oh, well, this is good enough. I won't ask how many people have done that over and over because I'd have to be the first one to raise my hand. But Oh, God has given us so much. I know there's people here who have done what I've talked about. You, you back down. You just you get excited about, it, about something, and you're going to claim it and claim the promise and stand on it, and, and then it kind of fizzles out over the next few days, and you're right back where you were. But I know that there's people here who have taken a stand in your spirit, and you kept standing, and you kept standing, and you kept standing, and God answered, didn't he? That's what God is looking for. If we're going to grow as a people, if we're going to experience what we sing about, if we're going to experience these changes in our hearts and in our lives, this is the pathway. God's done his part. And I realize we can't tackle it all at once, thank God. But I know that, the, I mean, we, we sang about God leading us on a pathway. God leading us through this life. Thank God he does. But I'll tell you, he's going to lead us to places where a battle. He's going to lead us to places where we're going to have to take a stand in our hearts and say, wait a minute, I know what the issues are here. I know where I stand because of what Jesus has done. That's my hope. It's not in me. And I will not be deterred from laying hold of what he has provided for me. And I'm going to, and whether it comes easy or comes hard, Thank God. Sometimes he gives us things that are very smooth and very easy. But other times there is a pitched battle that has to be fought. But oh, what we gain in that victory and and how faith grows and becomes stronger. That's what God is looking to build in every single one of us. I'll tell you, the church throughout all of its history has, has just lived at this marginal life, marginal level of life in, in terms of laying hold of the provisions of God. But I believe in this last hour, God is going to bring his people to a higher place, don't you? I mean, I had to argue with the Lord. I said, who am I to preach this? I need this worse than they do. But somebody's got to stand up here and and speak the truth. And I'm trusting it's not me. I'm trusting that God is getting something in, in this, that his heart is toward you right now. He cares about your life. He cares about the issues that bother you, that hold you captive. He cares about every little thing, and he's going to lead us. But all we need to recognize, when he leads us to a mountain, he doesn't mean for us to just throw up our hands and stay where we're at, but begin to challenge that and say, wait a minute, who art thou, great mountain? Before before Zerubbabel, that was one prophecy in, in one of the prophets, you'll become a plain. We have the right 
not because we are anything, not because we can do anything in ourselves, but we have the right to stand upon the promise of God and expect to see it fulfilled in our lives. The more we will learn to live like that, the more we're going to experience of what Jesus died to give us. You've got to go back to the beginning. That's the only way to become a Christian to begin with. We're going to have to stand against whatever obstacles arise from our putting our, our laying down our lives, turning from sin and trusting in Him as our Savior. We're going to have to fight through those things to get to that. But we're going to have to do exactly the same thing the rest of the way home. And I'll tell you, we have a God who's going to be with us in every single battle. Praise God. There's so many places in Scripture where you see that kind of a, of a spirit. Abraham, who was, you know, went out that one day to, God told him to make a, make a sacrifice, and he did all the prescribed stuff, and he stood there, and time went by. What happened? The birds came. Fresh meat, sure. The birds came. What did he do? He said, oh, well, I guess not. God didn't mean what he said. I'm just going to have to go back to the way things were. No, he beat off the birds, didn't he? I mean, you've had to beat off birds to get someplace spiritually. Yeah. Birds are going to come. The question is, what do we do when they come? Do we, do we have that, that, some, that sense in us that this is a cosmic battle? This is something where I am, I'm trying to serve God, and He is greater than everything, but I'm going to have to fight my way through. Of course, the, the picture of the Israelites we've used so many times. They, they had the promise of the land. It was there. Not only did they hear about it, when they went there, the spies went over and they brought back a, a bunch of grapes. It was so big it took two men to carry it. So now they're in a position of being able to taste and see, yes, this is exactly what God said it was. It's an awesome place. It's worth anything to possess it. God has said we can, we can do this. And that was the spirit of Caleb and Joshua. We're, let's go up at once. We're well able. Well, on what ground could you say such a ridiculous thing? Did, do we have hope here because our army is greater, more experienced? Are we, more, are we smarter? Are we what? No, there's only one answer. God is behind us. And the whole rest of the nation threw up their hands at the sight of the, at the thought about the giants and, said, and, and the giants trumped God. Well, how many giants in our lives, for all practical purposes, trump God and trump His promises? Hmm. And I don't want to say that to condemn, but I believe God wants us to wake up and think, think straight and be encouraged. God doesn't, God, God doesn't condemn His people. But he sure does know how to admonish and encourage us and point us in the right direction. You know, I, I thought about so many things, I guess. I thought about, uh, you know, something Brother Thomas used to say a lot about faith. <laughs> many of you will remember, he said, faith starts where it's at. And it starts where it's not with what it doesn't have. It starts where, it starts where, that, with what, where it's at with what it has and without what, what it doesn't have. Anyway, that's the general thought. It just starts. And wherever any of us is today, this is, where, this is all God is looking for. We could look at this and say, oh my God, I should be down the road and I just can't even imagine getting there. Well, let's just start here. Where are you at? What's the, what's the pressing issue? What is the thing? Sometimes for me, it's the, it's the want to that I need help with. Amen. Yeah, but I'll tell you, we have a God who can help our want to. He knows how to bring us to a sense of need and teach us and bring us up against something time and time again until we, we, we cry out and we say, oh God, this cannot go on and I'm sick and tired of giving in and blaming you. In effect, isn't that what we're really doing? If we're making any kind of excuse for ourselves, we're saying, God, you just haven't given me enough. It's your fault. It's not his fault. 
he holds out his hand and he says, you, st you take the step and I'll be with you. And You know, when they went into the land, the strategy was different, every, every city, every town. But every place the Israelites stood upon the promise of God and went against the giants, God backed them up and they won a complete victory. Every place they backed down in fear and they just didn't have what it took when it got in the battle, they backed down and, and just didn't believe God, they were defeated. And many of the tribes wound up living among, had heathen people living among them and it became a snare. You know that happens in our lives? This is the territory God's wanting me to conquer. This is the land. It's not a piece of geography. This is the land that needs conquering. And God is looking to replace me and with Jesus to live in here and to help me to be the kind of person he wants me to be. Man, I need him every day. I have no hope of, of that happening unless he has mercy upon me. But his provision is there. But what is my attitude when, it, when I come against a need? Do I say, oh, there we go again. It's, so, it's hopeless. It's, I've been here before. Da, 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 da. All those kinds of stupid things that we say. Or do we say, oh, God, you have provided the answer, and his name is Jesus. And I am not going to back down. I am not going to let go until you help me in this area. You are my source. You have provided this. I don't, this is impossible for me. That's a good, that's a good starting point. How many of you have had to come to that starting point with some issue in your life? And many times the problem is we keep trying. By God, we're going to do it. When God is saying, one of these days you're going to get it through your thick skull, you can't. You don't understand. This is not about self-help. This is about salvation where God supernaturally changes me from the inside out. You need me for this. Are you going to believe me? Or are you going to believe the lies of the enemy or the, 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 these parts of yourself that just don't want to let go? You're going to find any excuse in the world to hang on. God help us. I know there's many other scriptures. I don't want to I don't want to drag this out because it's one thought, but Hebrews chapter 4 has got a couple of good scriptures that bear on this. You know, this is the context of this is talking about the unbelief that caused the people of Israel not to be able to enter in. That's, that's what he's coming out of and telling us that in, in their day, long after all of that stuff, that history, there still remains a promise. God has given us a promise and those who believe enter in. And the warning here, again, this is a warning to people who have never come to Christ, don't stop short. Don't you come up and, and go so far and then stop going. You've got to get through that narrow door. You've got to be willing to come to that point where you abandon everything and say, I am Christ, come what may, live, sink, or swim, or die, or whatever. My life is His. Every other issue is on the altar. I tell you, there's got to come that point. I pray that God will do something for, for whatever life, wherever you're at in your life, that God will do what is needed. But anyway, it comes down here in verse 9. It says, for there, there remains then a Sabbath rest. This is not talking about keeping Saturday. This is a rest for the people of God. And the foundation of this, by the way, is going back to creation. When God created in six days, what did he say on the seventh day? What did he do? He rested. Why? It was done. See, that's the hope of the gospel. Everything necessary to establish a brand new creation, sin-free, has been done. So God is resting. He's not saying, oh, let me see what I forgot. I've got to fill in the cracks here. This is a done deal. But he calls us to enter into that done deal. So that's what, it's, that's what he's talking about. There remains that rest. It's available for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest, also rests from his own work. So we stop trying and start trusting, right? I've heard that one before. We stop trying to impress God and get to him to accept us, and we realize it, my standing is entirely the paste upon what Jesus did. End of story. That's my hope. 
rests from his own work just as God did from his. Now, this is an interesting scripture, though, when you're talking about entering into rest. He says, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. That sounds like a contradiction. There's a place of rest, so I'm going to strive to enter into it. I'm going to really put forth this effort. But doesn't that exactly coincide with what we've been saying this morning? There is a place where we lay hold of what God has given. Israel, to the extent they conquered the land, they came to a place of rest, didn't they? They conquered the, the territory, and, and they were able to go in there and, and find rest and, and enjoyment. They, they had all the crops they needed. They were blessed of God in, in great measure. But in order to reach that point, there were enemies they had to overcome, and they had to be willing to say, I will not stop until this is done. Caleb was the prime example. He reached a certain point when he was well over, he was 80 years or more. He was not a young man. And finally he came and said, give me my mountain. Well, the easy thing for Joshua was to say, sure. <laughs> uh, the only thing there is there were some giants who didn't exactly go along with the plan. But it didn't even go into great detail about all oh, this pitched battle. He just went in there and he took care of business because God was with him. Those giants didn't stand a chance. They weren't just against, they weren't fighting against a man. An 80-year-old man, they were fighting against the God who was behind the man. Every battle you and I fight, if we're willing to stand up and claim the promises of God and have that kind of a spirit, this is mine. I will not be denied. There is a God who will back us up. So let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Interesting that you come down to the bottom of this chapter and we're talking about the high priest that we have, the one who represents us to God and the fact that he cares and he's able to understand what you and I are going through. And he can do that because he's been here. He's been through all of the temptations. He's heard every, every negative voice that you've heard. He's felt every impulse from his body that you and I feel. Every earthly temptation faced him and he faced them and, and chose the will of God at every point. But this is someone who stands there and knows what, where you're at. And he's not, not sitting there with the spirit of, what's the matter with you? I did it. What's the matter? You know, why can't you? This is, I know where they're at. I know what I had to go through to open a door of hope. And I know that they, there's only one way they can possibly triumph in these circumstances. They're going to have to have divine help. You know that's how he did? He didn't do it in his own strength. God helped him. But that's exactly what he offers to every single one of us. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Now, you, many of you will remember that King James, it uses boldness. This is another one of those words that has a, has a range of meaning. It certainly doesn't mean timidly. It certainly doesn't mean that I'm not so sure about this. But how many of us approach God like that? Oh, please, God, will you help me? Instead of saying, Lord, I'm facing a battle here, but your word says this. And so I am coming on the basis of this word, and I am not going to take no for an answer. I need help. One of the interesting little tidbits about this word it's a, I'm not, I didn't really study it all out, and I don't think I could if I, if I tried. But I noticed this, there was a note about this particular Greek word, and it, part of the construction of the word comes from the Greek word for all. And I guess the best way to express it, express it in English is this is an all-in kind of thing. You know, we have the expression, are you in? And if you're really going to be positive about it, you say, yeah, I'm all in. But this is a, an approach to God where we are all in. We're putting all of our eggs in one basket. We are saying, God, I come to you because I have no other answer and I will not leave without the answer. I need you. I'm coming here. But this is my, my confession to you is, is one of boldness, of confidence, and it's not based upon me. It's based upon the Savior you provided me. But I am coming because it's my inheritance. 
My God, what would it be like if you and I had a million dollars in the bank and lived like paupers because we were afraid to go ask for it? I mean, that's a silly illustration in a way, but isn't, isn't that kind of where we're at many times in many areas? We are so easily talked out of it. And I'll tell you, we need to have that kind of boldness that the, that the Lord talked about. You can go back to Luke chapter 11, a very familiar scripture. Now, this has to do with prayer, but that's kind of involved, isn't it? When we go, aren't we praying? Aren't we talking to him? Isn't our confession, I'm all in? He gives us the example of the man with three loaves. Man comes from a, on his journey and says, I need, you know, he wants to set something in front of him, wants to feed him, doesn't have the ability, goes to a friend who has it at midnight, and the, the guy starts to object, I won't come, it's, it's late. But what, what does the man do? He doesn't give up, does he? There is a boldness to stay, say, I am in need and I'm not leaving without the bread. And so that's what happens. It says, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now, I don't believe he's talking about God being like that man, but I do believe this is an illustration of even on a human level, this man's boldness won the day, didn't it? It was everything that he needed, got what he needed. But why would the Lord give us this if it was not to encourage the same kind of a boldness toward God? Think about that. So on the, right here is where he says, so as a result of this illustration of boldness, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks the door will be opened. I'll tell you, do we, do we have a God who values, I was going to say brassiness, that's not exactly the word, but you know what I'm talking about. This is not where I'm ordering God around. This is somebody where I, this is a case where I'm coming to him because he has the answer to my need. I know it's mine because of his word and his promises, and I am not backing down, not leaving without it. And if it takes six months of praying, I'm going to, I'm going to stand. How many times have we told that in the Scriptures? Having done all? Give up, right? No, having done all, stand. You're going to meet the devil who comes with, you know, like a roaring lion. Stand against him. God help every one of us to take hold of this side of the truth. What a perfect example we have in, uh, in Philippians 2, one of my favorite scriptures where he says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There is, a, there is an effort that we put forth. But we put forth that effort in the understanding that it is God who works in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. Always when I am, when, I, when my will and my heart are aligned with God to do what he wants, to seek what he desires, and I engage that faith, Am I on my own? Does he send me into the battle and say, well, good luck? No. He immediately comes on the scene, and there is a, there's an inflow of divine help and divine life. That's the Christian life. But I sense in my own life, and I'm betting I'm not alone. I'm betting that's why the Lord allowed some of this. That there are areas where you and I need to start getting bold. We need to start saying, God, I will not let you go unless you bless me. You have promised this in your word. I'm sick and tired of just sitting here and singing about it and not experiencing it. We sing that wonderful song, He is all I need. He is all I need, all that I need. What's the second verse? Ah, does that sound familiar? Maybe I'll hope that he'll, you know, I will take him now. That sounds pretty positive to me, doesn't it? I'm going to engage my will here. This is, this is the kind of exercise of will God loves. That's what he's looking for from me, from every one of us. God's not, not just going to dump his blessings on people who don't care or people who just sort of hang back in unbelief and fear and all of that. 
God is going to let those things happen so that we can overcome them. And in overcoming them, we become what he wants us to be. And his life flows. So God is, God is looking for his people to have a holy boldness. I don't know what else to say. Anybody here need that? Anybody here need some more holy boldness in your life? Do you, you really think God just ex says, it's okay, you can just kind of muddle along and we'll, get t we'll take care of it someday, somehow, some way. God has given us everything in Christ. But there is a part that we play in laying hold of that and actually possessing it. And God is waiting on us, and many times we're waiting on Him. So one issue at a time, when you and I face this or face that or face the other, we need to learn. And I say we need to learn to go to God with that kind of holy boldness and say, Lord, this is what you said. I will not let you go until you bless me and help me in this area. I'm going to stand here and I'm not going to back down because I don't get the answer. I don't have a feeling. You know, in five minutes, I'm going to stand and I'm going to put my faith and my hope and my trust in your promise. And I believe with all my heart that that's, that's my only hope. I'm all in, Lord. I need grace. Every, my, every part of my being is in on this one. I just need you. I pray that God will give me and all of us that kind of a holy boldness to lay hold of his promises because he is faithful who promised. And he will continue this work in every single one of us. There's more territory for us to take, folks. It's not God's fault. On the other hand, I don't want to get uh, condemned and think, I've, oh, I need to be way down the... F no, I need to be here, taking, putting one foot in front of another, doing what Paul said, pressing toward the mark. Forgetting what's behind. Thank God we can do that. But reaching forth to what is before. putting one That's, that's the lifestyle that God has called us to. But I'll tell you, we can press forward in confidence, can't we? Do you think Paul went to the Lord and said, well, pretty please, Lord, won't you take pity on me? I'm, such, I'm so poor and I try so hard. Or did he rather say, God, I know what your will and heart is and the devil and my flesh are fighting against it and I will not yield to them. I am laying hold of what you have promised me. That's what, there's going to be opposition. That's why I use the word press. But we have a God who will honor holy boldness. Praise God.